Well, good morning, everyone. As always, I welcome you and greet you in the name of Christ, the one who calls us to gather here in the Lord's house to celebrate our faith and to give thanks to God for the blessings of life and the blessings of this day. You know, one of the things I love about this congregation is how much you really seem to enjoy one another and, uh, and how welcoming you are. I'll tell you what, this is the first church that I have never felt the need to have a stand up and greet your neighbor time. Now, a lot of you will be very grateful that I don't have that, that urge because a lot of people can't stand that. But I've done that in past churches because visitors would come in and they would later tell me not a single person spoke to them. Well, from what I've witnessed over the past year, you guys are amazing at reaching out and welcoming visitors and folks here and one another. And I'm grateful for that. that just, that's who you are. It's part of your DNA. And it's something to, to celebrate and to recognize. And so I just wanted to share that uh, bit of positivity with you today. As always, I welcome our visitors. And, and you know, I like to say that we consider you to be our guest. We really do. We want you to feel that way here. We want you to feel welcome. We trust and pray that you'll experience God's presence here today. Extra shout out to those joining us online. We have a number of folks who actually do tune in and, and watch us through uh, what I call the interweb. And uh, we're grateful that you would choose to do that today. As far as announcements concerned, when I look at the back of the bulletin, it looks like a pretty exciting week for our youth and children. You know, our youth are having poolside devotions this evening at 5.30. Uh, our children are having popsicles in the park, which I understand went really well this past week. Uh, that's Tuesday night. And then, let's see, yes, Wednesday, our youth are going to the escape room. Now, I've actually done that before. I don't know if you've ever been to an escape room before, but it's quite exhilarating uh, on many levels. But anyway, the youth are gonna do that on Wednesday. That sounds really exciting. You know, if you've got some young people, teenagers in your family or neighbors or whatever, man, share our Facebook stuff with them. Uh, invite them to come to our youth events. We'd love to have them come and be a part of that. And with that, let us continue our time of worship.
only one, ignite within us a fiery passion for your mission in the world today. Warm us by the spirit that we may feel your kindling blaze within, urging us to do your greater good. Make us wholly present to experience a new birth and awaken possibilities within us to share your love in the world. In this love and abundance, we come to celebrate your harvest, a harvest bearing the first fruits of the spirit within us. Show us how to use these gifts as we listen for your truth and the gentle breeze of your spirit. Amen. I invite you to join me now in our confession of faith. We believe in the one God, creator and sustainer of all things, the source of all goodness and beauty, all truth and love. We believe in Jesus Christ, our teacher, example, and redeemer, the savior of the world. We believe in the Holy Spirit, God present with us for guidance, for comfort, and for strength. We believe in the forgiveness of sins, in the life of love and prayer, and in grace equal to every need. We believe in the Word of God found in scripture, tradition, reason, and experience. We believe in the church, we who are united in the living Lord, for the purpose of worship and service. We believe in the reign of God as a divine will realized in human society and in the family of God, where we are all brothers and sisters. We believe in the final triumph of righteousness and the life everlasting. Amen. children up front for our children's moment. being such a good helper, Hunter. <laughs> Wonderful. Y'all have a seat. Hey. So today, we are going to talk about a letter that Paul wrote to the people in Galatia. Now, in this letter, it gave them some clues about how God wants us to act and how we act when we have God's love in our hearts. Now, y'all are pretty smart, aren't you? Not, not yeah. me, Mama. Yes, I think you all are smart. Y'all aren't shaking your heads, but I think y'all are all pretty smart. So I'm going to get your help. I'm sorry, I'm... Um, I'm going to get your help trying to figure out. I've got different words in this bag. Yes, different words. And y'all are going to help me figure out which ones might be in that letter that are ways that we might want to act and God might want us to act and which ways maybe we shouldn't act, okay? So can everybody pick out a word? Here, John, you can get one too. Put one back if you got it. Okay. I'll reach in and pick out a word. You don't know that word? Well, I can help you out with that. Right, do you want one too, Wells? 
You'll get his? Okay. All right. Who wants to go first? Me. Oh, Hunter's raising her hand nicely. Okay, so this one, it goes like this. It says patient. Do you think God wants us to be patient? Yes, I do too. So we're going to put that one up here. Very good. Y'all are already off to a great start. All right, Wells. You can't read it. It's a long word. We'll read yours in just a minute, John. So this one says loving. Do y'all think God wants us to be loving? Yes, you're right. Okay. Rosalie, can you read yours? Hatred. Hatred. So that's a no. Yeah. So we'll put that one. We'll just tear that one up. You want to tear it up? All right, Maddie, what is, let's see what yours says. Um, okay, I'll read it. You'll read it? Oh, it's on the other, other side. There you go. That was a very good job sounding out the letters. It's fighting. Do you think fighting is something that God, that they told them? No. Rip it up. All right. What about yours, John? Oh, let's see here. You've got another really long word. It says selfishness. Do you think we should be selfish? No. No. Rip it up. All right, Walden, what about yours? Can you read that or you want my, what's that? Kind. Do you think God wants us to be kind? Yes, exactly. So those are just some of the words that Paul, that Paul used in the letters. They're called fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. What does this one say? That says generous. God so that's, wants us to be generous. Yes, God wants us to be generous. And when we love God, we, those fruits grow in our lives. So let's what go ahead. Uh, I think we should. Okay, that'll work too. Can y'all pray with me? All right. Dear God, thank you for the Spirit. Help your... Fruits grow in our lives. Amen. And put it back in the back. You can go up to Miss Scotty or to your parents. As we celebrate our joys and concerns, we certainly continue to celebrate the gift of the Holy Spirit, which we remember and celebrate during the season of Pentecost. We're only a few Sundays removed from the Sunday of Pentecost itself, but we continue to celebrate the work of the Holy Spirit. Our scripture lesson today will speak a little bit more about that. But in Romans uh, chapter eight, Paul writes about the fact that sometimes We are struggling so deeply, we don't even have words to pray. And Paul assures us that when we find ourselves in those moments, the Spirit, God's Spirit, can somehow discern our inward groanings and can pray on our behalf. So we give thanks to God and for God's Spirit, which blesses us, particularly in times when our strength and maybe even our faith has evaporated, one of our great joys. For concerns today, we continue to remember those who, whose names are printed in our bulletin and our prayer list. Some of those folks continue to recuperate at home from previous surgeries or accidents. Marion Norman underwent knee replacement uh, surgery on Wednesday, and she is recovering very well, but will certainly have a period of rehabilitation so we want to remember her and 
her family and all of these folks and even beyond our own congregation in our prayers. And with that, let us pray. Almighty and gracious God, we celebrate the presence of your spirit in our lives. A spirit which is not just a concept or an idea to think about, but is a power and a presence which is ever surrounding us and is within us. And God, we give you thanks and praise that when we find ourselves in those dark places where we really can't find the words and the words that we could find don't do the moment any justice. We're thankful for your spirit who is able to hear the inward groans of our own spirits and our own souls and is able to, to be empathetic and gracious and gentle and kind and is able to empower us to continue to put one foot in front of the other. Your spirit who grants us wisdom when we find ourselves at a crossroads. We're not sure which way to go. We don't know the perfect way, so we trust you with the best way. Oh God, we give you thanks for your spirit who is with us when the winds and storms of life blow and we bend and sway, but we do not break. We give you thanks for your, pre your spirit who is often working in our lives in ways which go unknown to us. We look back over certain periods of life and we wonder how in the world we were able to get through that, how we survived, how we made it. We recognize, O oh God, that your unseen presence and grace were working in and through us, sending us people into our lives who would give us that strength, that listening ear, that compassionate, silent presence of support. Oh God, we remember your world today as we recognize that there are many who are suffering and struggling around the globe. We continue to remember those devastated by the earthquake in Afghanistan. We continue to pray for the people in, your, in Ukraine who continue to suffer the ravages of a senseless and brutal war. We pray for political leaders who are striving and working towards a peaceful resolution. Oh God, we pray for those across our own land, those who continue to, to grieve and mourn and try to pick up the pieces from devastating storms, tornadoes, wildfires whose homes and lives have been turned upside down and now find themselves lost and without. May they know that you are with them. Send them aid and send them help. And God, we continue to recognize the deep divisions which continue to deepen within our own nation, within our own land, this country which we love dearly. And God, we recognize that the decision that was made by the Supreme Court on Friday will bring those divisions closer to home within our own state legislatures. But not only there, but also within our own cities, our own communities, our own neighborhoods, even our own churches, and even within our own families around the dinner table. God, I pray that you will be with our leaders and legislators and others who are in decision-making positions. Oh God, help them to work not only for a just resolution, but one that is filled with compassion and mercy. And may we relate to and love one another the same way that we may fulfill the words in Micah 6, 8, that we may be people who do justice, who love mercy, and walk humbly with you, our God. 
closer to home, we remember those whose names are printed in our bulletins. We pray for others who may be on our hearts and minds at this time. Bless each and every one. Meet them at their point of need. May they find that your grace is active and sufficient in their lives. O oh God, all this we ask in the name of the one who came to bring us peace, your son Jesus Christ, the one who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This time I invite our ushers to come forward that we may offer our tithes and gifts. I have a confession. First of all, in finding this arrangement, I decided it'd be a wonderful one to share with you, if for no other reason than to get to hear Brian's accompaniment. So, and can it be? should gain an interest in the Savior's blood. Died he for me who caused his pain, for me who him to death pursued. Amen. his father's throne above so free so infinite his grace emptied himself of all but love and bled for Adam's helpless race tis mercy Condemnation now I dread. Jesus and all in him is mine. Alive in him, my living head, and clothed. 
clothed in righteousness divine. Bold I approach the eternal throne and claim the crown through Christ my own. Amazing love, how can it be that the Our epistle lesson for today comes from the book of Galatians, chapter 5. For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence but through love become slaves to one another. For the whole law is summed up in a single commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. If, however, you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. Live by the Spirit, I say, and do not gratify the desires of the flesh. For what the flesh desires is opposed to the Spirit. And what the spirit desires is opposed to the flesh, for these are opposed to each other, to prevent you from doing what you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not subject to the law. Now the works of the flesh are obvious, fornication, impurity, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, anger, quarrels, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. I'm warning you, as I warned you before, those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. By contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. There is no law against such things, and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, 
Let us also be guided by the Spirit. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I'm guessing that even though you may have never read the novel before, most of you are familiar with the names Dr. Jekyll 
and Mr. Hyde. Most of us have some idea of what those names mean when we hear them mentioned. We usually think about the two sides of a person's personality or maybe uh, two different sides of their own selves in conflict with one another or something to that effect. But it was, uh, it, those names did come from a novel written by Robert Louis Stevenson in 1886. And if you have read the novel, you may remember that the central character was a gentleman named Gabriel Utterson. He's kind of a London legal practitioner, I guess kind of a, a lawyer of the day. He's the central character, and he goes around trying to investigate some very strange and odd occurrences between his old friend, Dr. Henry Jekyll, and a murderous criminal named Edward Hyde. Now, I'm not gonna go through all the twists and turns of this novel. Certainly a lot of uh, interesting aspects to it as he goes through his investigation. But as this character, Gabriel Utterson, nears the end of the novel, it is revealed to him that Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde are the same person. With Dr. Jekyll transforming into Mr. Hyde, using an unnamed chemical concoction, a kind of potion, I guess, if you will, that would transform him from Dr. Jekyll, this mild-mannered, uh, proper Victorian gentleman, into this alter ego, someone who is wild and chaotic and kind of fiendish in a way, Mr. Hyde. He concocted this potion so that he could experience, I guess, a different side of himself, a, a wilder, freer side of himself, and he could do this without the negative consequences impacting himself as Dr. Jekyll. He could experience his darker urges and desires through this alter ego, Mr. Hyde, rather than have to deal with them himself as the good and proper Dr. Jekyll. I was reminded of this story as I pondered our scripture lesson from, from, for this week from uh, Paul's letter to the Galatians chapter 5. You may recall last Sunday we spent a little bit of time in Paul's letter to the Galatians in chapter 3, but this time we move on to chapter 4 and we see Paul drawing a sharp contrast between what I guess we could call two modes of living. He describes life in and through the flesh, and then he describes life in and through what he calls the fruit of the Spirit. Seems to be a, a, a sharp dichotomy between the two, almost kind of a, a dualism uh, to human nature. This business about the flesh versus the Spirit, or we might could even call it the soul. One thing I want to clarify though, to, to try to prevent any misunderstanding here, is that the word that Paul uses for flesh is the Greek word sarx. And it doesn't mean our physical body. It doesn't mean our anatomy. The Greek word soma is the word for that. It means anatomy or the body. Paul is talking about flesh in the sense of kind of that part of us that we could characterize as maybe our weaker, fallen nature, maybe more of our kind of debased nature, that part of us that tends to prompt us towards destructive behavior or behaviors towards others, unhealthy behaviors. That's what Paul is, is really referring to here when he talks about the flesh. He's not saying that the body is bad, anything like that whatsoever. He's simply talking about that more, I guess, negative part of human nature. And so he actually lists in quite specific detail some of the behaviors that can result from this flesh, this part of our human nature, sexual immorality, hatred, discord, jealousy, rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, and on and on he goes. 
One of the things that I mentioned last week about the Apostle Paul is that we always have to be careful in reading him because Paul is not writing in a vacuum, in a void. Paul didn't just wake up one morning and say, you know, I, I wonder what I want to do today. I think, you know, I think I'll write a letter to the church in Galatia. I don't know what I'm going to say. Let me think about it and I'll write a letter and, and just kind of hammer something out and send it to them. No, that's not what Paul ever does. When Paul writes one of his letters, he's addressing specific congregations and he's addressing specific problems or conflicts or issues that he has heard about that are going on in these churches. He's addressing real issues. The reality is if it weren't for conflicts in Paul's churches, we probably wouldn't have any of his letters. Maybe we should be thankful that there were some conflicts in his churches because we have a deeper understanding of Paul's mind and his thoughts in addressing these conflicts. His letters are well thought out responses. And the truth is Paul wouldn't be mentioning the things that he writes about today if they weren't already happening. And so he's addressing them. So this business about negative character traits and behaviors were things that were actually going on and being experienced in this congregation in the city in Galatia. It was causing a problem. It's causing chaos in the church. It's causing disunity in the church. And it may be hard to believe, but one of Paul's primary concerns is that of unity in his congregations. And so Paul lists all of these negative character traits and behaviors and he pretty much outrightly condemns these behaviors and to use a real churchy word, he exhorts his, exhorts his congregation to instead live by the Spirit. Seek the ways of the Spirit. Pray to the Spirit. Because the ways of the Spirit are in sharp contrast to the ways of the flesh. Joy, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Really the opposite of the list of vices he writes about. And so for Paul, living by the Spirit is the way to foster harmony and shalom, peace in his congregation. Now it would be tempting for me to shoot off into the stratosphere and to go into a lot of different areas with this business about conflict and dissension and, and uh, jealousy and anger and hatred and discord and all of these things because we certainly have those things going on around us in abundance. I mean, I could talk about some of the debates and things that are going on within our own denomination. I could certainly take us to Washington Washington certainly sounds like some of the things which Paul lists here in his letter. I could go to a number of places, but I'm not going to do that this morning. I'm going to keep things a lot closer to home, and I'm going to try to dig a little deeper than just going somewhere out there. And the reason for that is because I want us to understand that this, this conflict between flesh and spirit or between flesh and soul is not just something that's out there. You know, it's not just those people. You know, how easily we, we, we can create that they versus we or us versus them scenario. No, the conflict that Paul is really writing about is not simply out there. It's not simply them. But it's actually something that is going on inside, inside each of us. It's not just an outer conflict. It's an internal, inner conflict conflict inside of ourselves. There's an old story that's attributed to Native Americans, based primarily the Cherokee. Don't know if it really came from, from the Cherokee or not, but there's an old story that maybe some of you have heard before. It's called The Tale of Two Wolves. The Tale of Two Wolves. And the story goes like this. One evening, an old Cherokee told his grandson about a battle that goes on inside people. He said, my son, the battle is between two wolves inside us all. One is evil. It is anger, envy, jealousy, sorrow, regret, 
greed, arrogance, self-pity, guilt, resentment, inferiority, lies, false pride, superiority, and ego. The other is good. It is joy, peace, love, hope, serenity, humility, kindness, benevolence, empathy, generosity, forgiveness, truth, compassion, and faith. The grandson thought about it for a minute and then asked his grandfather, which wolf wins? And the old Cherokee grandfather simply replied, the one you feed. Well, we can see why this is such a memorable story because it is so profound and it is so true to our own lives. We know that this internal battle goes on within each and every single one of us. It is not just something that is out there with those people, with them. No, it's also something with us, with I, with me, inside. It's something that is inside of our hearts and our minds and our bodies and our souls. You know, elsewhere, Paul seems to write about this internal struggle. I think about Romans chapter 7. When Paul asked the question, why do I do the things that I don't want to do? And why do I not do the things that I know I ought to do? What an amazing statement. Paul is recognizing the complexity that goes on inside each and every one of us. I think about that, that image, you know, of the, the good angel on one shoulder and the bad angel on the other, I guess a demon maybe, and they're both whispering into, you know, the person's ears, competing for attention. Well, we wish maybe that it was that simple, but our inner psyches are not that simple. It's not so much that we have this good nature versus this bad nature which are competing for dominancy inside of us, it's more along the lines that we just have these parts inside of us that really are neither good nor bad. We want to identify them that way, but the truth is we just simply have these parts inside of us that are seeking constructive expression. Parts that sometimes we're embarrassed about or we're ashamed of, and so what do we do? We keep them hidden. We have inner wounds that maybe we've picked up along the way. They could be from anywhere. But they're wounds that we are ashamed of. And so we try to keep those wounds in check. Some of you may be disappointed to know that I've been a long fan of Sylvester Stallone movies. You know, I was a teenager back in the 80s when Sylvester Stallone was quite the action hero, and so I've always kept up with the Rambo movies, John J. Rambo. And in the last installment, we find John J. Rambo trying to live a very peaceful life on a ranch somewhere along the southwest border. And he's with this woman who has this young daughter, and he's become kind of a, an uncle related somehow to them. And he runs the ranch, and he's just trying to get along and mind his own business. Well, this young girl who is kind of like a niece to him and he's been a mentor to, she decides that she wants to go and find her real father, her biological father who is in Mexico. And she goes to tell John J. Rambo that she wants to go do this and he dissuades her because he knew her father and he was a terrible, terrible person. And uh, he wants her to have nothing to do with her biological father. Well, she starts talking to him and arguing with him about how people can change. And she even tries to use Rambo and is, as an example of that. She said, well, look at you. You're not like you used to be. You've changed. And he simply looked at her in his Rambo-esque kind of voice and said, I haven't changed. I just keep a lid on it. Well, most of us know that keeping a lid on it sooner or later doesn't really work. If it stays kind of boiling under the surface, it's usually going to come out in an explosion. 
And so we go back to this Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Dr. Jekyll wanted to find a safe, quote, safe way to express his wilder, crazier uh, side. And so he created this potion that would turn him into this hideous monster, um, but it would be a different person everyone would think, and so he could kind of get away with it. But he lost control, is what happens in the story. He loses control, and Mr. Hyde gets out of hand and actually kills someone. Psychologists talk about the shadow, that we all have a shadow side, that we all have a part of us, a part of ourselves that we're not really happy with. We try to, quote, keep a lid on it. We try to keep it in the closet or in the dark. It's not appropriate, we don't think. We don't want anybody to see that part of us. Maybe our families see it occasionally, but we try to keep anyone else from seeing it. And so we hide it and we do not give it the proper constructive expression. I'll give you an example from my own background. I've shared with you before that when I left the ministry, quit the ministry in 2011, I went through a very dark and difficult period and I was drinking very, very heavily and was basically uh, a drunk and had a, really a severe drinking problem and I found a new therapist during that time, someone who could really help me. And one of the questions that he asked me, he said, well, what do you do after you've had a few drinks? What are you like? And I said, well, sometimes I'm silly and playful, but sometimes I get very sad and I cry, and sometimes I get angry and sometimes I get mean. And he said, so when you're drinking, you you're able to experience your emotions. You're able to kind of feel your feelings, so to speak. And I said, yeah, I guess I am. And so he told me that the real challenge for me was to learn how to experience and express my emotions and my feelings while sober. That that was the challenge for me. I wanted to do it, but I, don't, I would only allow myself or enable myself to do it through alcohol. No, while you're sober, give expressions, expression to these emotions. It was the challenge and the task that he would give me, especially for those wounded parts of myself which I wanted to hide. The wounded parts of ourselves need to be expressed. They need to be fed, as we think about the story of the two wolves, but they need to be fed love, and caring, and forgiveness, and compassion, and patience. Especially those parts of ourselves that we are ashamed of, those places of woundedness and deep pain which we keep in the shadows and we never let see the light of day. We never let anyone else in or anyone else see them. And the reality is, Healing only occurs when we bring these things out into the light and we integrate these darker sides with the other parts of our personalities. One question you may be asking yourself is, well, how do I know what my shadow is? How do I know that I have a shadow and how can I identify my shadow? Well, one way to try to identify your shadow side is to ask yourself this. What trait or, or what aspect of other people are you most critical of? What is that thing that you sometimes see in other people that just really gets at you, that just irritates you to no end, that you are quick to jump on and criticize and point out? Well, whatever that is, it's probably something that's inside of you, seeking expression, a part of yourself that you're unhappy with or you consider to be improper or inappropriate or whatever, but it's a part of who you are and it is seeking expression in a constructive and positive ways. Sometimes we project our shadow sides onto other people and we treat them harshly and quite unfairly. Well, as Clint Eastwood would say, enough of that. 
I'm not a psychoanalyst and I don't play one on television either. But the truth is I have greatly benefited from one and have found a great deal of healing through the process. So Paul seeks a solution in all of this to these two modes of living, this uh, light side and this dark side, the flesh living to the spirit and so forth. And of course he would say that seeking the spirit, praying to the spirit is certainly one way to find relief and a solution. But he gives us one other way and I'll close with this. Paul goes back to a scripture from the Old, Old, Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, the Torah. And Paul writes this, Love your neighbor as you love yourself. As I said, that's not original with Paul. He's pulling that out of the Hebrew Bible. Jesus also quoted this scripture from the Old Testament once. Jesus was asked to summarize the entire law the entire Torah, the, the, the first five books of the Old Testament. And Jesus responded by saying, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And then he said, But love your neighbor as you love yourself. Quoting from Le Leviticus 19, 18. A lot of strange and bizarre things in Leviticus. But that is the verse that Jesus pulls out of the entire book. But the part that I think we often miss in that verse is the last two words, as yourself. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. I think the truth is that we are only able to love others as much as we are able to love ourselves. And I mean the whole self. The sides that we present to other people, our personas, but also loving the darker sides, the sides that we're embarrassed about or ashamed of or keep hidden from everybody as much as possible, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Loving yourself means to, to be true to yourself for sure, but it also means being patient and compassionate, being empathetic and forgiving and honest and even merciful with yourself, your whole self. So maybe the question for us today as we consider Paul's words here is this question. How well do you love yourself? How well do you love yourself? How you answer that will go a long way and how you are able to love others. Amen.
once again may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship and the power of God's Spirit bless each of you today and every single day. Amen. Thank you.